Awesome. Welcome to Mr. Neve's awesome lesson. Uh, this is all going to be about Swinburne and religious experience. So, first of all, it's really important that you understand who Richard Swinburne actually was. Let me move out so it's a bit clearer on the screen for you. Um, he was born in 1934, and he describes himself as somebody who is an Orthodox Christian. Um, he believes that faith in Christianity is rational and coherent in a rigorous philosophical sense. So in other words, he goes through as a philosopher, looks at key philosophical concepts, and he makes faith work with those key philosophical concepts, uh, which can be quite tough, actually. Um, he's very much influenced by Thomas Aquinas, who's the 13th century monk, and I know we've done some work on him in the past. Um, and that is the real key when it comes to Richard Swinburne, is that he is a religious person. So it says there, Swinburne moves in his writing program from the philosophical to the theological, building his case rigorously and relying on his previous arguments as he defends particular Christian beliefs. He has attempted to reassert classical Christian beliefs with an apologetic method that he believes is compatible with contemporary science. So in other words, he's trying to justify religious belief using philosophy. Um, he's pretty good at it too, actually. You'll like him. He's an interesting sort of character. You may not agree with everything, but you can guess that because of this approach, he therefore is trying to prove the validity of religious experience. He's going to be talking about why religious experience should be valued and why it's valid, perhaps, in proving the existence of God. And that, chaps, is the key point. This idea that religious experience can prove that God exists. So that's the key. His first principle in doing this is called the principle of credulity. So in other words, is it believable? Is it reliable? Credulity. So as he says, what one seems to perceive is probably so. So just consider that for a minute. We exist in a world where we believe in what we perceive. If we didn't, then we couldn't exist in this world. I believe that that's a table. I believe that that's a board. Because I see it. Because I can feel it. Because I sense it. It is logical to believe in the things that logically seem to exist around us. This is the principle of credulity. And uh, so therefore, number one, reliability of the claim. So these are the things that might hold you back from this principle. And it's this idea of, well, is the person making the claim reliable? Or is he a liar? So if he's had a religious experience, because remember that's what we're talking about today. If he's had a religious experience, or if she's had a religious experience, are they generally the type of person who lies about this sort of stuff? Or... Can we normally accept what they've said? Because you know what? I'm telling you that this chair is blue, okay? And normally I don't lie. So you can believe that this chair is actually blue. Number two, truth of the claim. So is it likely to be true? Or is it sort of impossible? So am I telling you stuff that is likely to be true? The textbook says, as an example of this, um, such as a being able to read text of the size you're reading now at a distance of 100 yards, then his claim about our religious experiences are not likely true. So in other words, if somebody's claiming that they can do this, all these weird and wacky and crazy things, it's actually unlikely. Number three, how does one show that God was present in the experience? So this can be a problem as well. You might have some sort of religious experience, but how do you know it was religious? How do you know God's in it? Or is it just some sort of other experience? So that's another side. And number four, can what is claimed be accounted for in other ways? Perhaps natural phenomena. Eclipses were always talked about an awful lot. So is that one of the problems? Is there some sort of natural phenomenon that could describe a religious experience or is it truly religious? Or as we looked at the textbook more recently, TLE, is it some sort of brain uh, event? Is it some sort of epileptic seizure that you're in fact having and not really having a religious experience. Now, um, Swinburne's refutations to these points are these. 
and you can have a look at them along the bottom of the screen and just have a read of them and think to yourself which one matches with which claim. Okay, so there are the four reputation, refutation, sorry. Have a look at the four claims above, which one matches with which claim. Thinking music. Nice, thought about it, great. So, first one, you can't possibly say that all claims are made by unreliable people or that just because he's lied in the past, he's lying now. So he could be a liar but maybe he's also had a religious experience. So claim number one, can't really be made against it. It can be taken that claims are generally reliable. Number two, truth of the claim. Well, this is the one that refutes the truth. You can't show that all claims are untrue. Just because one is false, they're not all untrue. So again, if there's an issue about truth, well, maybe this time it's true. How can you prove that this time is actually false? So that's a bit of a key. That's the second one. So move out of the way so you can see the arrow. Let the shine come down. There we go. Number three, God is everywhere. Prove that God isn't part of the experience. So if you have this understanding of God, then in fact God is everywhere. God is part of the whole universe. So rather than showing that God was present in the experience, the person should be turning around and actually saying God wasn't present in the experience. How can you prove that God wasn't? And the last one, before I use up too much data, God is part of everything. He can create the experience through a variety of physical ways, even TLE. So you could argue that what is claimed can be accounted for in other ways, and you could in fact find the scientific reason why somebody's had this episode, but then why can't you just say that, in fact, God created that scientific reason? Why can't you say that, in fact, it was God who put it in us in that way? So they are the things that are said against the principle of credulity. And you can see Swinburne's refutations saying, basically, this is why it is believable that people can have religious experiences. His second principle is the principle of testimony. And this is an even more interesting one. It's this idea, as he says in that quote at the top, in the absence of special considerations, there you special considerations, in the absence of those, the experience of others are probably as they report them. So just like I said to you at the very start, if I tell you that this morning I went to the shop and I bought a couple of those really nice little bagels with raisins in them and then I toasted them and I ate them, well, my testimony is generally believable. Why would you doubt me if I told you that? So if I also told you that I went to the shop and I saw Jesus, why would you doubt me? I'm not going to lie. I'm telling you the truth. Why would you doubt it? We should believe what people tell us. Someone who has had an experience of God has good reason to believe that there is a God. I saw God this morning when I bought my bagels. I now believe in God. Why would you doubt that? doesn't make sense. And the next bullet point, the testimony that others report Sorry, the testimony of others reports a claim to the existence of God. And finally, the religious experience is more likely that God does exist. So Swinburne uses this principle of testimony to say it's likely that these religious experiences happened. We should sort of believe them because people talk about them. And therefore, um, it's likely that God exists. So he doesn't just talk about religious experiences. He talks about how religious experiences prove the existence of God. And that's a bit of a key. If you have a look in the textbook, textbook for nuns and James watches is this one. If you have a look at the textbook on pages 109 to 110, there are some other refutations and arguments for this principle of testimony and also Swinburne's claims in general about religious experience. It's important to look at those. Have a look. Read through them. We can believe in normal sense experiences, as I said. Um, the ordinary sense experience is a third person public, uh, meaning that somebody else can confirm your claims as, as to what you see and hear, whereas accounts of religious experiences are often first person private. So this causes a problem. If it's just me that saw Jesus in the shop this morning when I bought that bagel, then why would you believe it? So that's the other issue with some of these Swinburne points, that they're often private-ish things that happen to individuals. Uh, so how do you account for that? And he does, he does account for it. He argues against that. He, he says that 
look, so many people have them, how can you deny them? And that's a bit of a key term there, that idea of cumulative, okay? Cumulative means that there's lots of these things, so surely the argument can be used to say everybody can't be making them up, some of them must be true, or perhaps because there's so many, they're all true. Maybe everybody's had these religious experiences that claims that they do happen. So that is a bit of a key point as well when it comes to religious experience, according to Swinburne. And number three said, even if every single person who has had a religious experience believed completely that there was an experience of God, it would not prove that God is the right explanation for such experiences. Well, yeah, that's the argument against Swinburne. Maybe everybody thinks it's God, but it's not, because there's something in our brain, and people have argued this, that makes us think about God and believe in God. Um, but Swinburne says, because of the cumulative argument, it suggests that if we all consider all the arguments for the existence of God, so we've had the design argument we talked about earlier, cosmological arguments, ontological arguments, take all of those together, and religious experiences, put them all together, and it's more likely than not that God exists. So that's what Swinburne is trying to argue here. Okay, interesting points. Read through those things. In the lesson, you're going to be doing um, writing about the arguments for and against Swinburne's views. So this is key. Swinburne about religious experience is a key. If you get a question about Swinburne, or sorry, a question about religious experience in the exam, you must mention Swinburne. You have to talk about the principle of testimony, the principle of credulity, and his cumulative arguments. Thank you for watching. See you in the lesson soon.